Okay, we're running a little bit late, as we have been uh, for the last few days. Um, this afternoon, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Hodge, who is uh, currently Professor of Astronomy at the University of Washington, and has served for the past 18 years as the editor of the Astronomical Journal, which is published by the American Astronomical Society. He's an international expert in the field of galaxy structure and evolution. His research has included work at some of the finest observatories in the world, as well as with the Hubble Space Telescope. Professor Hodge has authored over 400 scientific articles and has written 17 books, with most recent titles being Higher Than Everest, An Adventurer's Guide to the Solar System, and An Atlas of Galaxies of the Local Group. His research interests uh, concentrate on nearby galaxy structure and the evolution, stellar populations, star clusters, and gaseous nebula. This afternoon, Professor Hodge is going to be talking about Barnard's Galaxies, Its Mysteries Revealed, and I'm pleased to welcome this year's Helen Sawyer Hogg lecturer, Dr. Paul Hodge. My topic is Barnard's Galaxy. But before I can begin with the topic, with that title, I'd like to explain how the lecture will develop. The first bit of the lecture will deal with one of the first mysteries of this object. And that was a mystery of where it was. Where was it? And so I'll give you some history, a little bit more interesting history, perhaps, than for some objects. I'll then describe how this object became the first certified extragalactic object, first galaxy which to have its distance fully established as being beyond the limits of our own Milky Way. And then I will describe more recent research on the object leading up to the present, at which time my colleagues and I have spent a great deal of time, particularly Hubble time, uh, studying its evolution and its history and its current activity. First, though, we have to talk about it with a different name, because when it was discovered, it wasn't a galaxy, it was a nebula. And it was called Barnard's Nebula at first, for the reason that you might guess, namely, it was discovered by Barnard. It was discovered by E.E. E. Barnard. Edward Emerson Barnard was his official name, but many of his friends thought that E.E. E. stood for Eagle Eye Barnard, <laughs> because he had exceptionally good uh, eyesight and could see things uh, that others couldn't see. Let's stop a minute and learn a little about, bit about Barnard's life, because it was a very interesting life. It began south of the border, that is south of the Canada-US border, in the state of Tennessee. He was born into a very poor family. In fact, he had to go to work at age nine and therefore missed out on the kind of education you might have expected an astronomer to have in his early life. But it turned out that he had to go to work in a rather auspicious location, namely in a photography studio. Photography, when he was at that age, which was in the 1860s, was a new, sort of a new thing. And I'm pretty sure that his years as a youth working for a photographer helped in his later life for him to become one of the very great astrophotographers of his generation. He was born in 1857, and as a professional photographer's assistant, he learned all of the chemistry that he was otherwise so new to the world at that time. He found astronomy to be a really interesting hobby. 
As, after all, at age nine, you have a lot of energy and you can carry out a full-time job and spend the evening looking at the skies, I suppose. Uh, but he did develop into quite what you, particularly those of you who are amateur astronomers who have telescopes and look through them, would consider a successful amateur astronomer. His, his very uh, highly skilled viewing abilities were developed partly because he found that hunting for comets was one of the most rewarding of the things one could do at that time. In fact, there was a wealthy and enlightened man in the state of New York at that time who offered $200 for every comet discovered. And Barnard immediately took up the challenge when this was clear and discovered several comets, enough to uh, marry his sweetheart and uh, have a house built, which he called the Comet House. He became rather well known because of many discoveries, including the comets, but other things as well. And his friends, when he was 25, got together enough money so that he could go to college. He had missed school pretty much entirely. So at that advanced age, they sent him to Vanderbilt University. And his fame at that point as an astronomer was already so well established that the university made him director of their observatory uh, when he entered as a student. And when he completed his work there, he was hired to, by the Lick Observatory, which at that time was just installing what it then called its 36-inch refractor, which we now call the 0.9-meter refractor, except that anybody who knows anything calls it a 36-inch still. Um, that, that's a strong tradition on, uh, on Lick. And the, the arrow on this picture is pointing to the correct dome. The other dome, of course, is uh, the dome of the 3-meter, or the former 120-inch telescope at Lick which also will enter our story, but not as Barnard's instrument that was installed much later. He was hired after a few years at Lick by the Yerkes Observatory just before the 40-inch or the one-meter refractor was installed. And that's where he spent most of his career. And while there, he did some remarkable observational uh, things in the solar system, but even more uh, pioneering work in astrophotography of the Milky Way. Using the world's largest telescope at that time, um, <clears throat> his discoveries included uh, things that made that uh, observatory uh, famous for or new things. It was also a very stimulating place to be. And here is a picture uh, which shows that uh, rather well-known people visited your keys. And I'm hoping that some of you are close enough to the screen um, to recognize some of these faces. For example, that one. That's Albert Einstein in 1926. You may not recognize that one, but you may be able to tell by the fact that he's the only one looking off in another direction, that that's the director of the observatory. <laughs> but Ed Edwin Frost was an astronomer of somewhat unusual uh, characteristics, namely he was blind. And that one is Eagle Eye Barnard, later in his life when he was about 55. One of the things he discovered that probably most of you uh, know about is the fifth satellite of Jupiter to be found. Amalthea is inside the orbit of Io, and it's a very difficult object to see, not only because it's small, but also because it's, it's comparatively close to the disk of Jupiter. And it took Barnard's uh, very excellent eyesight to make his discovery. He also, while at Yerkes, made many other discoveries in the solar system and in the Milky Way. And uh, many of the dark 
clouds, the dark nebulae, have Barnard's numbers because of his uh, catalog of these objects. It's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that this story is, is not apocryphal, but I'm told that Barnard was the main reason that many astronomers did not believe Lowell who saw canals on Mars. Because Barnard couldn't see them, and, and the opinion was that if Barnard couldn't see them, they can't be there. He wrote many papers about his discoveries and his measurements. Enough papers were published in the premier journal of astronomy in the United States, namely the Astronomical Journal. I'm not saying that's the best journal in Canada, because there's the, the uh, Royal Astronomical Society as a journal, so uh, I'll say it's the best in the United States. Uh, he became the associate editor of that journal and served in that capacity for many years. And I should mention, uh, that when I was reviewing the history of that journal, I discovered that Barnard, in fact, has the record of publishing the most papers in number, posthumously. He published 13 papers after he died in this journal, so that's quite a record. Okay, back to the main topic, the discovery of Barnard's nebula. He found it in 1884 with his five-inch large field retractor. When he looked at it with this six-inch longer focus, it disappeared. But he found that that was just the result well known to many of you of the uh, uh, fact that it was a very low surface brightness, large object, easier seen in a large field. He described it as round uh, and right, quite large, half the size of the moon, and without a strong concentration of light towards the center, but rather even distribution of light. And this discovery was published that year in the Sidereal Messenger. It was later looked for, four years later, I mean three years later. People didn't react as rapidly then as they seem to now. With a much larger telescope, namely the one at the University of Virginia, the Leander McCormick Observatory. And an unnamed astronomer, according to the history books, found two nebulae there instead of one. Actually, I don't think the astronomer was unnamed. I think he was just, his name wasn't mentioned in the publication. Anyway, uh, neither position seemed to match Barnard's position that was published in the Sidereal Messenger. But the observatory published the results of this uh, examination for these two small, high surface brightness objects. Now, you've seen this fellow yesterday. This is Dreyer, uh, <coughs> the compiler of the NGC. And he picked up Barnard's description and included Barnard's nebula in the NGC. Now, it was originally listed with Barnard's description in, encrypted in the code that Dreyer used in the NGC uh, in the usual way. There was the very faint, large, and uh, diffuse. But he put the positions in there based on the Leander McCormick measurements. And so he assigned NGC 6822 to one of those, and he later on named the other one when the index catalog was published, IC 1308. And it was described as, as faint and small, and uh, the GBM is gradually brightening towards the middle. Well, the University of Denver's telescope, then it was not at the university, I believe, but 
and it was a, uh, a 20 inch refractor at Chamberlain was turned to it and how noticed that there was a discrepancy in position and description for the object in the NGC catalog called NGC 62. It didn't agree with Barnard's description or position. But that was uh, more or less forgotten. And in 1900, the astronomer in Paris, I won't in Montreal try to pronounce any French names because I'm sure I'm blacked out, so I won't, I won't try that one, uh, looked for it and decided that it wasn't there at all in any of its guises. And so we published a note to the fact that NGC 6822 didn't exist. Wolf in 1970 was the first to take a photograph of it, and that was near Heidelberg in that mountain called Königstuhl. I wasn't able to find a picture of Wolf, <laughs> um, but you know, the, the internet is wonderful. I was able to find this picture of a wolf uh, and no, no clue that would discourage me from the belief that its name was Max also. So, um, <laughs> In his photograph, Wolf found three gal I mean three nebulae. He identified on the basis of the NGC catalog as one little one as 6822, the other one as IC 1308. But then there was this large new nebula south of those two that was large, brown, and faint. And so immediately it was given a name. It was called IC 4895. And for years, that's how it stood. And it wasn't until 1922 that Perrin in Argentina took enough photographs and measured enough positions to establish this really complicated history. And in fact, the new object that Wolf had found was Barnard's original nebula. And the others were unscrambled by Perrin. Uh, to the satisfaction of everyone. To the satisfaction, in particular, to astronomers at Mount Wilson, who were interested in what these things were. Astronomer Duncan at Mount Wilson used the 100-inch telescope there to take pictures of nebulae of various sorts to try to understand them. And he obtained a very nice image of this object. And he said, why, it looks to him like the Magellanic Clouds. And that intrigued one of his colleagues, who also agreed that when you looked at them at more or less the same scale, they seemed to have certain similar characteristics. One seemed to have uh, resolved nebulae at one end, uh, both of them seem to have a, a light, a lower surface brightness um, body. And so that person, whose name was uh, Edmund Hubble, decided to take a series of photographs with a 100-inch telescope as part of his program of looking at large diameter nebulae that weren't as clearly associated with the Milky Way because he had a suspicion about them. At that time, he was getting many photographs of the Andromeda Nebula. But it's a big galaxy. But at that time, it was a big nebula. Uh, and it took him a long time to work up his data. And so, before he finished that, he finished his study of Barnard's nebula, NGC 6822. And this is his image obtained with the 100 inch telescope in which he identified certain objects. And I'll use this arrow to point out that this is what was IC 1308 for a while. This was NGC 6822 for a while, but of course this whole thing now is 6822. 
He found <coughs> Cepheid variables. He found almost a dozen Cepheid variables. And those of you really close to the front, namely closer than I am, can make out uh, the identifications of those on this diagram, on this, on this image. And he found several diffuse objects, including IC1308 and the other, and the once 6822, that included from spectra the uh, emission nebulae and other things that were not emission nebulae that he thought might be background galaxies but have since been found to be star clusters. The important thing that he found was that the periods and magnitudes of those Cepheid variables, those 11 variables, fit the period luminosity law that was discovered a little over 10 years before to exist in the Magellanic Clouds. And his once friend, Arlo Shapley, had used statistical methods to establish zero point for the period of luminosity law, allowing the distance to any object that had set periods to be determined. And here we see a comparison between these 11 Cepheids that Hubble found with the period luminosity law found for the Magellanic Clouds. And that gave a distance of 700,000 light years. And Hubble said, there's no way that that's in our Milky Way galaxy. This is an external object. It's an external system. He didn't use the term galaxy. He never used it in his life. He called them extragalactic nebula. He didn't like the term galaxy because that was Shepard's term. <laughs> OK, now what does that mean? Well, at that time at least, our galaxy was at least 50,000 light years across. NGC 6822 was then. Uh, the previous one said yeah, in radius, here it says across. But it must be external to our galaxy. We now know this first galaxy is actually a little bit farther than that because Shapley's period of velocity relationship, zero point was a little bit off, as you'll see. It's about three times farther than uh, Hubble established. So we'll now turn to some more modern studies of this uh, object. It wasn't until almost 40 years after Hubble that people began looking at this galaxy again. It had, of course, as, as you notice, I've stopped saying Barnard's Nebula, and I'm now calling it a galaxy, Barnard's Galaxy. More variable stars have been found, particularly by Susan Kaiser, who, who uh, did a thesis in the 1960s on its Cepheid variables. But also, in the meantime, RR Lyrae variables have been found, providing another independent distance criterion, and eclipsing variables are known in the system. So this new distance is based on a combination of the Cepheids and R. Lari variables, and it turns out to be just a little bit less than the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, 1.8 million light years. I was interested in the 1960s in studying its gaseous nebulae and did a survey with the Palomar 48-inch telescope, which showed up some 11 gas clouds in addition to those that Hubble had found. And we were, at that time, thinking that they could be used to measure the distance scale of extragalactic objects by measuring their sizes. Sandage and others had established the possibility of uh, establishing distances to galaxies, even without having to look at look for sepians. And so we studied these in many ways, but in particular 
to see if they could be used to establish distances. We could. And we showed in 1980 that, in fact, that method doesn't work because larger galaxies have larger dust clouds in general, and that spoils them as a distance criterion. Nevertheless, these gas clouds are interesting, and we continued to study them. In this, in particular, we did a survey a few years ago at the to peak, uh, and increased the number of known objects of this sort uh, to over 100. I think 144 is the number you see in front of you. And that gave us an opportunity to do statistics about the size distributions and even more important, luminosity distributions of star forming regions, which is what these things are, of course. And we were able to, uh, to study them to very faint limits with these more modern instruments and detectors. And I'm rather pleased with this diagram, with this image, which is a recent four meter image um, obtained <coughs> uh, with an array of CCDs over many uh, different wavelengths, including H alpha, which here is represented as red, of course. The object that Hubble called Roman numeral two, he didn't call it Hubble three. Um, Hubble was not a particularly modest person, but he didn't put his name on either Hubble's law or the Hubble constant, or did he put his name on these objects. He just called them Roman no numeral one through nine in the case of Barnard's nebula, and he left that to others to add the Hubble name. Hubble three was a fascinating object because it's a, it's a uh, bubble-shaped object. It's the one on the right in this picture. Hubble 1 is the one on the, on the left, and Hubble 2 is down below, and invisible on this image. But Hubble 3 turns out to be a, a wonderful example of a wind-blown bubble that has been formed because it has, at its center, an extremely hot, very luminous star, which you can see there is a sort of a bluish star. Not only that, uh oh it's gone too far. I've got to see my backwards. Just one. Oh, you can now. I can see. Ah, I'll put this with the back. Did it. Did it. Okay, great, thank you. These arrows point out uh, a, a remarkable fact, which it hasn't been, hadn't been found in any other object at that point. These are mini bubbles, I call them. And it happens that uh, the explanation of this is that the bubble was formed by the expanding gas pushed out by the strong winds of that central, highly luminous star. And as the expanding gas moved out, it encountered, encountered other stars forming that also were hot that then produced their own smaller bubbles on the rim of the big one. OK, we use the HST to look at the two most uh, luminous objects, which turned out to be IC 1308, also called Hubble 5, and Hubble 10. Hubble 5 is a highly luminous object, very much brighter than Orion. And it's powered by a star cluster of very, very uh, hot stars located at this position. But it also has an entire uh, field here of very bright young stars, massive stars, that explains the expansion of the gas uh, of, of Hubble 5. And the age can be measured by the color magnitude diagram of this association, as I'll describe in a few minutes. Hubble 10 include, is the uh, object that was thought by the early astronomers to be NGC 6822, but it's, it's also a luminous, somewhat slight, uh, somewhat more luminous object than Hubble 5. It's an H2 region with a embedded <coughs> association of extremely hot stars. There's another object down here that was found in the Palmer survey later. 
and uh, it also turns out to be very young. These things are very large uh, and young, so they're less than 10 million years old, which is extremely young for an astronomical object, and they're, and they're quite large. If, uh, if Hubble 10, for example, were, were brought in to our galaxy and placed at the distance of Orion, it would be quite a spectacular object. And you would be having all your neighbors come over to look through your telescope at it, even in bad, bad uh, light conditions, because it would be quite bright. I'll now turn to the story on the star clusters, which is also developed early in the 1960s and is flowering at the present time. Four of those things that Hubble found, that he called diffuse, um, were found later to have colors, and, and that's all people had was colors, um, uh, suggesting that they were globular star clusters. But the colors weren't very good. And therefore, the fact that they seemed a little off for globular clusters, at least in three cases, uh, didn't bother people very much. However, when, when I looked at them photoelectrically with the, with the lit 120 inch, um, I found that the blue colors, in fact, were, were really true, these objects had the wrong colors to be globular clusters. And yet they had the right brightnesses. They were as luminous and as big as globular clusters, but the colors were wrong. I also, using that telescope, looked for other star clusters beyond the Hubble ones uh, and found several candidates of clusters, but they were really difficult. You heard Brent describe how difficult some clusters in the Milky Way are to find, even if they've been discovered before, these haven't been. Um, and sometimes um, it's really uh, doubtful that you have a cluster. And in this case, the candidates were extremely faint, and they were simply too small and faint to study in any detail at all to confirm their nature from the ground. So we went to the telescope that isn't on the ground, the HST, and found that we could get the kind of data we needed to establish their nature. Hubble 7, in particular, of the three that we were able to get good HST data for, turned out to be a marvelous example of a globular star cluster of the standard variety. Both in size and in structure and color, and in his color magnitude diagram, it's essentially identical to standard globular clusters of the Milky Way, such as M13. So we know that at least one object in NGC 6822 was formed close to the beginning of star formation in our part of the universe, some 10 to 15 billion years ago. When we looked at Hubble 8, which is a more spread out galaxy, it's not, I mean, cluster, it's not as, uh, it's not as the surface brightness isn't as great. And yet it looks very much like, say, say M53 or NGC 53. Um, globular clusters in our galaxy have similar structure. But we found it isn't as old as a globular cluster, which explains its bluish color. It's only a billion years old. Of course, it's only astronomers who can say only a billion years old. Uh, so it's a very young object by comparison to globular clusters, which means that NGC 6822 was doing something that our galaxy wasn't doing a billion years ago, namely forming globular clusters. The bluest object of all those that we had, of the three that we had, was Hubble 6, which also looks like a globular cluster, but maybe those of you who like to look at globular clusters will look at this image and decide, well, maybe not. And in fact, you would be quite right, because this thing is very young for a globular cluster. It's only 80 million years old. This color management diagram establishes that quite, quite well. Therefore, 
we have a remarkable thing. We have a galaxy which has hardly any globular star clusters, but the ones that have show a tremendous spread in age. Whereas in our galaxy, all of the star clusters that are massive and large like this, with masses in the same range of 100,000 stars, are old. They're all 12 or more billion years old. So we find that this galaxy had a different history as far as the star cluster formation is concerned from that of our galaxy. What about the open clusters? Well, you saw how it's difficult it would be to study open clusters from the ground in something at this distance. But with the space telescope, we can do a little bit better. Here, for example, is the object that I called C25, cluster candidate. C stands for candidate in this case, because I couldn't do anything more than just say, well, this might be a star cluster. It might also be a thumbprint. But anyway, in this case, <laughs> it was a star cluster. And here it is with HST. It turns out to be an older star cluster. We don't have an accurate age yet, but we're working on that. We have about 100 op uh, objects that we suspect are open clusters. Certainly, most of them are good candidates to be open clusters um, based on our HST images. And most of these are very young, most less than a billion years old. And there are two reasons for that. One reason is that to be easily seen, even with HST, they have to have bright stars. And the more luminous stars, of course, are those that are young. <clears throat> the second reason is that clusters as small as this in any galaxy, but especially our own, and we don't have any reason to doubt that this is true in Barnard's galaxy, don't last very long. They don't have enough mass to resist the tidal effects of nearby masses like molecular clouds, uh, which tear them apart. In our galaxy, they, they're torn apart sooner than a billion years on the average. There are a few that last longer, but most are, simply don't last very long. In 6822, or Barnard's galaxy, they probably can last longer. It's not such a violent place. Spiral density waves and things like that are not, uh, not so active. This particular cluster shows that the um, human eye is not the only way to find things. So I'll just spend a moment on this to advertise the fact that one of my students uh, did what I didn't know was going to really ever be workable, and that is he developed a program to automatically, without human eye inter intervention, uh, find star clusters uh, in, in these images. And this is, this is one of the 40 or so that he, uh, his, his program found that I had not found looking at the, at the images by eye. Okay, so at, at NGC 6822 has old and young globular clusters. Does it only have young open clusters in the catalogs that we are putting together? The answer is yes only has young open clusters, but that's, as I explained, um, may not be the actual situation if those clusters either escape notice from their distance or if they've been destroyed tidally. But we seem to have an opposite situation. Our galaxy has both open and young. Open clusters, but only old globular clusters. Okay. We do know, as I said, there are some old open clusters present. Uh, yeah. And so the question is, is it our galaxy that's strange? We only have old globular clusters, whereas 6822 has uh, a whole range of ages. So maybe it, we're the ones out of step. And before I go on to star formation history, I'll answer that question by saying, I think we are. I think we're out of step. And that's because we have, uh, another student of mine has worked 
on the Andromeda globular clusters, and we picked out some globular clusters there that seem to have peculiarly blue colors, and we got HST images of them, measured their ages, and they're young. They're, they range in age from about 50 million years to about 200 million years before we got good images. So Andromeda is still forming globular clusters, at least it was 50 million years ago. And it seems to have clusters that span, span the entire age range. So it's M33, similar as some such clusters. <clears throat> and surveys of other large spiral galaxies are turning them up too. There's one particularly interesting one in a galaxy that probably not many people have seen with their, um, with their own telescopes, NGC 6946, but it's a nearby optic. It's very close to the Milky Way, difficult to, to see. Uh, but it has and one galaxy uh, that we're just uh, finished analyzing, an international group of people. Um, and we, uh, we find its age to be only 100 million years, and yet it's, it's almost as massive as, as the most massive globular clusters in our galaxy. So the cluster formation history of NGC 6822 seems to, at first glance to be remarkable and, uh, and, uh, and hard to understand, but it turns out it's probably not either of those things. It's our galaxy that has a remarkable cluster formation history. What about the star formation history? What, what about the stars between the clusters? Well, we have 10 HST fields now, and we've measured the color magnitude diagram for nearly a million stars in these fields to find out what the star formation history is for these objects. And the way we've done that is a technique developed by one of my, my students when he, for his thesis. He's now at Kitt Peak. Uh, but the, the method was to get a really good color magnitude diagram like this for, in this case, hundreds of thousands of stars for a field, to very carefully measure the completeness of this and the errors of measurement, which we can do by throwing thousands and thousands of artificial stars into our image, and then remeasuring the properties of the, of the of the whole image, including those artificial stars, and see how well they, they come back to us. And that gives us a measure of the completeness as a function of the different properties of the stars. And then we take theoretical evolutionary models of a variety of ages and a variety of chemical abundances. And we give them the same incompleteness and the same errors as our data have. So they look like this. They look like what you see here. Except they're based on theoretical calculations for different ages and for different abundances and for different distances and for different reddenings and we can vary all these things. And then we make thousands, well, I mean, we, this is something you can't do without a big bunch of computer time. We make thousands of color magnitude diagrams based on those theoretical calculations, but varying the different parameters, the age distribution over time. And then we make a statistical comparison of those thousands of color magnet diagrams with this one and with the others that we obtained with the galaxy and find the best fit. And the answer that we get is a star formation history. It tells us how many stars were formed at different periods in the history of that galaxy. And here, for example, is a typical star formation history result for one field, one Hubble field in Barnard's galaxy. And we find that it appears as if this field has stars as old as 12 or so, or a billion years, and that as time went on, it form stars at about the same rate as it did at the beginning. <clears throat> the rate has, has been fairly uniform, which we calculate to be about 
five times 10 to the minus 10th stars per year per square parsec. Now that sounds perhaps a bit small, but that's not so small. It's two stars per century for this field, but this is only one field in, in uh, NGC 60 and 22. So we know something about its history. Its history has been very calm in this area. It's formed stars at a low but constant, nearly constant rate. And that's something we didn't know. We didn't know it for our galaxy, and we didn't know it for many other fields. And so it turned out to be a very uh, interesting and gratifying result. However, there are some areas that have a history like this, where they start out at about the same level as the area in the previous example. But now, they're forming stars at an enhanced rate. And these are the areas near where the bright gas clouds are visible, as you might expect. So we conclude that this galaxy, Barnard's galaxy, must be about as old as our own galaxy, because its earliest stars formed at about the same time as our earliest stars. And it's formed both stars and clusters at a low rate, but fairly uniform, including even the globular clusters. Some areas are active now, but they're not overwhelming. Those of you who have observed the Magellanic Clouds had the, had the fun of going to the Southern Hemisphere and seeing them through a telescope, no doubt saw 30 Doradus, which is the big, bright, gaseous nebulae in the large Magellanic Clouds. Barnard's galaxy doesn't have a 30 Doradus. 30 Doradus is exceptional. It's an incredible factory of new stars. But those objects in Barnard's galaxy are big star farming regions. They're not phenomenal, they're not uh, exceptional, but they uh, indicate that some conditions have, more, have, have been found in these portions of the galaxy at the present time for gas to be crystallized into stars. So, in that way, this fellow, Barnard, who has a sort of unique way of counter counterbalancing the telescope, <laughs> and here's uh, many years ago, found an object that was lost for several years after that, refound, was learned by Hubble that this was an extragalactic object, and therefore it became the, our first galaxy. And in more recent years, it has turned out to be one of the few galaxies that we really understand in terms of the history of star formation and of, and of cluster formation. Thank you. to five. <laughs> We've been behind anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes to an hour all weekend and Dr. Hodge has brought us right back on schedule. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Hodge personally uh, for a very informative and interesting talk. Uh, he's always been a bit of a hero of mine. I don't have very, very many heroes. Uh, but uh, in astronomy, you know, gentlemen like him, Paul Narf, uh, I, you know, always had, uh, you know, a lot of respect for and everything like that. So I want to thank him again for being our Helen Sawyer Hawk lecturer for this year.